So welcome to the widget walkthrough talk. Uh, my name is Satyan Desai. I'm a developer on the YUI team. And today I'm going to be taking you on a walk through the YUI 3 widget class. Um, the talk is geared towards people who want to develop their own widgets in YUI 3. Uh, for the first half of the talk, uh, I'll be covering some of the design principles behind the YUI 3 widget class. And then we'll move on from there to look at the code behind a concrete spinner implementation and see how that puts the principles we discussed in the first section into practice. So with that, let's jump straight in. Uh, when we set out to create the YUI3 widget class, the widget infrastructure for YUI3, um, the first question which comes to mind is what were the set of goals we were trying to address? What was it that we were trying to do? And I think the first goal which comes to mind um, is a fairly obvious one. Uh, we wanted to make sure that all our widgets in YUI3 shared a consistent base API. Um, so no matter which widget you looked at, they had a consistent generic set of properties and methods upon which they were based. The second thing we wanted to look at was formalizing um, development or design patterns which we'd encountered uh, developing YUI2 widgets over a four-year time span and make sure that we formalize them and make sure that widgets built in YUI3 followed that pattern. Again, so that as you moved from one widget to the next, they'd be doing the same types of things at the same point in the widget lifecycle. The third area we wanted to hit was the area of markup and class names. So we wanted to make sure that all our widgets uh, share a consistent markup structure or philosophy, um, especially in cases where widgets were doing similar things. And I think more importantly, we wanted to make sure that they shared a consistent class name structure. Um, so the classes which were applied to those uh, markup elements were consistent across widgets. And the final thing we wanted to address, um, highlighted by those two bullet points, was the whole kitchen sink concept. So we wanted to make sure that we don't ship monolithic widgets with, an, with the entire feature set collected over a series of enhancements over a long period of time. All of that doesn't get bundled into a single class which gets shipped as the widget. We wanted to deliver lighter core widgets and then allow the user or potentially other component developers to mix and match features into that core widget set. So let's spend some time digging into each of those development points, starting with the API. So in YY3, the widget class extends base. Uh, not sure how many of you are familiar with base, but base is our generic state management object in YY3. Um, so what it brings to the table is attribute support which widgets will use to maintain um, their state model. It brings to the picture event target, which allows widget to publish custom events. And it brings, it, brings onto the table plugin host, which drives that mix and match feature set functionality we looked at on the previous slide. So by virtue of extending base, widget has all that functionality available to it. And additionally, it defines the generic set of attributes I was talking about generic set of methods, which we thought would be applicable to all widgets. So as a custom widget developer, all you need to do is extend the widget class and then start customizing behavior specific to your widget. So the common API I mentioned, what, what's in it? What does the widget base class contain? It contains a generic set of attributes which we think will be applicable across all widgets. So things like a reference to the outer containing element for that widget or the bounding box, um, attributes for height and width management, attributes for state management such as focus, disabled, visible. All those attributes are implemented and bundled at the base widget class level but can be customized for your particular implementation. Moving on to methods. Um, the methods the base widget class establishes are obviously the get and set methods which are used for attribute management. The on and after methods which are used for event subscription. So users of your widget can use the on and after method to subscribe to custom events published by your widget. And then a series of, I don't know what I'd say, sugar uh, methods. Methods which sit on top of the attributes which define the widget. Um, and just provide a more user-friendly interface for end users of your widget to interact with. 
So there's attributes, methods, and the final component of the API is events. So by virtue of storing its state in attributes, it already, or widget already provides a low level event interface for not only users of your application to hook into, um, but also for your internal development to key off of. And we'll, we'll dig into some of those concepts a little later. Apart from the attribute change events, like the height change and width change event shown there, Widget also publishes events for each component of its life cycle. And we'll look at that in a little more detail um, as we move along. So that was the, the, the common API or common base class concept we wanted to establish for Widget. The next couple of slides I'm going to talk about common design or development patterns which we wanted to introduce um, for widget development. I think the first thing uh, we wanted to look at which came up early during widget development was the idea of separating the state of a widget from the code or the set of methods which are responsible for the visual representation of that state. Right? Um, not quite unlike the MVC type patterns you see out there. Right? We wanted to apply that to the widget infrastructure and we thought it provided certain benefits. Um, just, just the idea of coding your widget so that all the methods which deal with widget state, and when I say app methods, I'm, 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 I was looking for the right word there, but what I'm trying to say is any methods which define the logic for your widget, which have nothing to do with how it's represented on the page, but just basic logic methods. If widgets were coded so that, that those set of methods were separated from the visual representation, the first benefit it could provide was the ability for reuse. Um, let's take an example. Say you had a spinner widget, which is what we'll be looking at a little later. Logically speaking, all it really does is allow you to select one value from a given range between a min and a max. That same model and that same implementation could potentially be used in something like a slider, for example, which has a completely different visual representation for that selection or UI interaction. Another thing we're looking at along those lines is um, the idea of a parent-child relationship or a list, list item relationship. And there again too, if we could have the model for those types of widgets separate from their visual representation, we could use the concept of adding children, removing children, navigating around children, having events bubble up from children to parents. We could have that model reused across widgets which vary in visual representation like a tab view could use that model along with a menu along with a tree, essentially. All of them could share that same set of code while having separate visual representation. And what would bind the two things would be the powerful YUI3 event infrastructure. So we'd be using that power to bind these two aspects of a widget together. It's worth clarifying one thing, I think, is that initially during widget development, we were actually considering breaking these out into separate classes. So as a widget developer, you'd have to implement a model class, a renderer class, or a view class, along with the glue which bound the two together. We backed away from that idea um, just in terms of the engineering overhead and potential constraints with um, JavaScript engines, potentially, uh, and combined those pieces of functionality into one class. Um, but the patterns uh, we're suggesting people follow uh, make sure that methods for each of these various responsibilities stay separate. And, and we'll look at concrete details of that as we look at the uh, spinner example. So that was one area of design uh, we wanted to look at, the state UI separation. The other area was defining a concrete life cycle for the widget. Um, so we wanted to make, sh make sure again that any widget you looked at, if it did a certain set of operations in a given life cycle moment, those operations or the things it did would be consistent when moving from one widget to the next. The three life cycle moments which widget defines are the init moment, the render moment, and the destroy moment. The init life cycle phase and the destroy life cycle phase actually come from base. So base defines these and it defines what needs to be done during these two phases. The render phase is introduced by widget's aspect of a view or a visualization for a given state. Um, so widget adds the render moment. Digging into those phases in a little more detail, the init phase is all about um, creating or the state for your widget, establishing the initial state. Um, so as part of the widget hierarchy, when you initialize a widget, what it'll do during the init phase, which is called by the constructor, 
is loop around each of the classes in the hierarchy, set up the attributes which you define for the widget, and we'll dig into that ATTRS property a little later, and invoke the initializer, initializer if it's defined for that class in the hierarchy, which can perform any additional initialization steps. And going back to the slide about state versus UI separation, um, an additional benefit this provides is if we split up the, the state aspect and the view aspect, after initialization, you have a fully functional widget which you can call methods against, which you can set and get attributes against, and have the model be updated accurately without anything being reflected in the DOM. So for larger scale applications like, say, um, Yahoo Mail, for example, you could create instances of widget, not have them rendered to the page, set them up in the state you require them in, and then render them when they're ready to be displayed. So once any widget is through the init phase, its state is in a, in a, in a consistent known state and can be programmatically worked against. On the flip side of things, um, the destroy moment is responsible for cleanup. Um, I'm sure that's something you all are familiar with. And the idea here is just to provide consistent hooks so that any widget class implementation provides a destructor if it has cleanup to do during the destroy phase. And traditionally, stuff going on in the destructor is, are things like um, detaching event handlers and cleaning up or nulling out any references to heavier objects which the widget may be holding on to. Um, so uh, memory can be freed up the next time garbage collection is invoked. So those are the two state-related moments, init and destroy. Init for creating the state, destroy for getting rid of it. And in the middle is the render phase. So as mentioned, this is introduced by widget. And as part of the render phase definition, the base widget class implements a renderer method. So traditionally, the renderer method is not something extending or extended or customized widgets need to implement. Widget implements it, and it implements it so that it calls these three abstract methods, render UI, bind UI, and sync UI. So as a, or as a widget developer, your task is to implement each of these three methods for your customization. The role of each of these um, we'll go over in a little more detail, but at a high level, the idea of render UI is, is the step at which the component or the widget lays down its visualization. That's where it creates DOM elements, um, which the widget will use for its view. The bind UI step is where the widget um, sets up that event bridge we looked at. So it's where the, the widget sets up events which will translate changes in the model or the state over to the view and vice versa, where it'll pick up DOM events from the view and uh, use them to set the state on the widget. And the sync UI step um, is a phase where the widget can, can take the given, its given state in any moment in time and update the view to reflect it. So it's a way to sync the view for a given uh, widget state. So those are the three phases, init, render, and destroy, which should be consistent across all widgets um, in the YUI3 library. So we discussed common API, we discussed design and development patterns. Next area I wanted to touch on was consistent markup and class names. So the default widget class, um, the, the default markup pattern is, it uses is a dual box pattern, uh, which we found is useful in a wide variety of widgets. Um, the idea behind this model is that the outer bounds of the widget are defined by the bounding box seen there. And the role of the bounding box is to control functional aspects of the widget's layout. So things like its width and height, uh, things like how it impacts content around it, such as you know, whether the widget is a display block type widget or whether it's more of an inline or more accurately an inline block type widget. Those aspects of the widget are controlled by the bounding box. The bounding box traditionally will not have um, visual aspects applied to it. So you wouldn't apply a border to the bounding box. You wouldn't apply a padding to the bounding box. And this allows us to deal with height and width properties um, without worrying about box model variants across browsers. Where the, where the widget's actual visual look and feel come into play is the content box, which is nested inside the bounding box. So the idea is that the content box, for example, for the spinner would contain the input element plus the button elements required for the spinner, 
it could contain, it could have borders defined, padding defined, a background color defined. Um, so, so that's the separation of roles in terms of the bounding box and the content box. And we found this model to be useful in a variety of widgets. So block level widgets such as an overlay or a data table or inline widgets or inline block widgets such as buttons, for example. An additional benefit of providing the dual structure is that the bounding box acts as a holder for decorator elements. So if you want to do things like rounded corners or shimming, for example, or shadow impl implementations on browsers which don't support them natively through CSS, the bounding box acts as a container where you can add elements for th those decoration items and they, they can sit under or over the content boxes required um, for their presentation. So that's a deal box structure. In addition to the structure, we also wanted to make sure that the class names we generate, either as markers, so for example, class names we generate to mark elements inside the widget, such as the content box or the bounding box, are consistently named. Um, and in this case, what that means is that they're, hopefully you can see that, hopefully they're prefixed by um, an application ID and then use the name of the widget um, as a prefix combination uh, before they add any additional uh, values which define things like, for example, the state they're representing. All right, so all the class names generated are in their own space defined by the application prefix plus the name of the widget. So in the final design um, area I wanted to cover was the area of the kitchen sink, the light base implementation with uh, a mix and match feature set. Uh, I think this is something you've seen mentioned. Um, it was mentioned in a YUI3 talk I gave. Eric mentioned it this morning. And the idea here really is be, to be able to ship a light core widget class for your particular widget, but then allow either the end user to mix and match in features as required by them on particular instances of your widget. So in this case, using an example, as a component developer, I could write an overlay implementation, a light overlay implementation, which doesn't have animation or I.O. built into it. It's not built into that same one monolithic class. End users can create instances of overlay on their page, which doesn't have that functionality. But if there's one of 10 overlay instances they want on the page, which requires animation, they can pull down the animation plugin, apply it to the overlay instance using the plug interface, and that single instance will have animation capabilities, while the other nine on their page will stay basic overlays. In a similar vein on the component developer side of things, if I'm a component developer and I want to create a tooltip class, I don't necessarily need to extend something like overlay, which has a large part of the features I need, but has a bunch of features extra which I don't really need. So for example, overlay has a header body footer region um, which it supports, which I don't necessarily need for tooltip. It has advanced positioning support, which I don't necessarily need for tooltip. Um, so I can choose to build my tooltip, which just extends widget and pulls in just the extensions I need for the functionality I need. So position, widget position would give me basic XY support. Widget stack would give me stacking or shimming support. And I don't need the header body footer support or the advanced positioning support, which overlay has. So you get the mix and match flexibility, both as an end user on a per instance basis or as a class developer or component developer at the class level through extensions. Um, so that, that's about all I had to say in terms of the general design approach uh, for widget, the, the, the stat set of patterns we were looking to follow. Um, using that discussion, I wanted to look at actual code for a spinner implementation as an example. Uh, and we can dive a little bit deeper into each of those concepts we were talking about. This spinner example is actually live on the developer site. Um, so that's, that's the example I'll be walking through, hopefully in a little more detail than the example uh, when we look at the code snippets. The spinner is a good example because when we're talking about the, the model versus view concepts, the spinner really has only one part of its model, its actual value, which needs to be reflected in the DOM. Uh, and we'll follow that value attribute throughout the set of methods we looked at uh, and see how it's handled. 
So as a widget developer, um, the first thing you need to do is extend the widget class. So in this case, spinner extends widget, and that's fairly straightforward. And then, um, in sticking with, with the design patterns and API we discussed, Spinner then adds the customization aspects it needs. And what drives most widget customizations is the set of attributes for that Spinner. They define the model for the Spinner, how that Spinner is going to hold its state. Following that definition, optionally, we specify any additional stuff we want to set up in the state through the initializer. Um, it's rare that people actually need that. The bulk of the work in terms of setting up the state for a widget occurs through the attribute definition. And, and we'll look at code snippets which show all of that. Um, so the initializer generally stays empty or undefined in most wi widget customizations. The next three steps um, are obviously required for any custom uh, widget implementation. And as mentioned, they define the markup which will represent the widget, the set of events which bind the state and view sites of the widget, and then a method to sync up the view based on a given state. And finally, the destructor for cleanup. So we'll dig into each of these implementations for Spinner and see how they pan out. Starting off with the constructor. That's fairly straightforward. There's nothing really widget-based in there. All it's setting up is a constructor function which will define um, Spinner instances. And the only thing it's doing is chaining up to the parent class, which in this case is widget, to kick off the lifecycle we looked at. So simply calling the superclass constructor will kick off the init phase for the widget, which will set up attributes and call initializers as required. And then just a simple extend call to have spinner extend the widget class and define whatever methods it needs to add to the prototype. So that's basic. Um, constructor definition plus the extend call. Nothing really widget based in there. The one interesting thing to point out is that the fact that the signature for all components which are derived from base, so it would apply to widgets too, is consistent across the YUI3 library. Um, so users of your widget will already be familiar with that signature um, as an attribute name value bag which they can pass into the constructor of any of your widgets. So the first widget related aspect which comes into play is this idea of a name. Um, we needed a way to identify a specific type or class of widget. Um, and the static name property is what we came up with to handle that. Um, ideally, if we could have inferred it from the actual function, constructor function, that would have been ideal. But in the absence of that, as a widget developer, what you need to do is tell us the string which uniquely defines your widget. And by convention, we've been using the class name in camel case to set up that value. And where it ends up getting used is in generating the unique class name prefixes I discussed earlier. And also as a prefix for any custom events fired by the widget. Um, so in, for example, if you have a widget which bubbles events up to the Y instance, for example, or bubbles events up to another bubble target, people listening at that bubble target can distinguish the render event from a spinner uh, compared to the render event from a menu or a tab view, for example, and act on it accordingly. So that's the name property. We discussed constructor, we discussed the static name definition. The attributes definition is where the majority of the model work comes into play. So for the spinner implementation, the value is at the heart of everything. That's the actual value which the spinner is displaying or uh, storing at any particular point in time. The min and the max define the range for the spinner. And then let's say for this example, there's a minor step and major step attribute which defines how much the value should jump based on certain input. When you set up the attribute configs for your particular class, um, the configuration bag um, for any attribute has a default value which can be provided for the attribute. So this is the value which the component developer thinks, thinks is the suitable default value. Additionally, um, as you can see in the value attribute, you can also define helpers around that attribute such as validators, setters, and getters. We'll get into a little bit more detail there, um, but the idea is that all logic surrounding the management of this attribute is centralized 
in the attribute configuration. Another interesting point to note is that as a design pattern, we make sure that we don't implement the validation logic in line in this static configuration. Um, delegating it to a prototype method allows people to extend our spinner implementation and not have to deal with this static bag of properties uh, which we've set up. And we'll look at that in a little detail also. So that's the set of attributes which spinner defines. In addition to defining its own attributes, Spinner can also override attribute configurations of classes it's, ex it's extending, right? So in this case, the strings attribute is actually an attribute set up at the widget level and is used for localized string support on the widget. In this case, Spinner, all it wants to do is override the default value, which for widget is an empty, empty bucket, and add the set of strings it's going to be using for its default locale um, for the Spinner UI. Right, so it could if it wanted to override the validator, the getter, the setter, or any other part of the attribute configuration if it wanted to. So that's the attribute bag um, for the widget. And that's really what defines the state the widget will be holding on to as part of its operation. While we're discussing attributes, um, it's worth pointing out a hook we're looking at for widgets to support progressive enhancement. Um, stepping back a few slides, we looked at the idea of setting up a default value for an attribute in this attributes hash we looked at earlier. So that's the value which the component developer thinks is the, the ideal default value for this component. Additionally, the user can pass in an initial value for the component as that config parameter we saw in the constructor. So the value for the attribute falls back to the default if a constructor value isn't provided, otherwise it uses the constructor value. The HTML parser allows the developer to define another source for that value. So if the, if the user doesn't want to set the value for the spinner programmatically, for example, in the constructor when they create a new spinner, they can point the spinner to markup which already exists on the page for a progressively enhanced solution, and spinner will use the HTML parser definition to get the value for the value attribute from an input box which may already exist in the markup on the page. Right? So, so the idea is that markup on the page is just another form of initialization data for the widget uh, to populate its model or its attribute set. So we've looked at constructor, we've looked at the attribute setup. Um, let's move on to the lifecycle methods. The initializer, as I mentioned, really in most widgets shouldn't have to do too much work. Um, most of the definition occurs in the attribute set and that the widget infrastructure takes care of creating for you. In this case, all Spinner is doing is setting up a couple of additional custom events which it's going to use as part of the state setup. Um, so by the time the attributes are configured and the initializer is run, widget, uh, the Spinner widget is ready to programmatically use. And it's not rendered on the page, but you can develop against it. <coughs> on the flip side, the destructor for the spinner implementation, all it really does is clean up any event handles it's holding on to. So any event listeners it's subscribed internally, it cleans those up on destruction and then frees up any of the heavier object references it may be holding on to so that they can be garbage collected if no one else is using them. So that's the initialization and destruction phase um, and the attribute setup in terms of the state. The interesting part for widgets is the render portion, right? So how this widget is actually visually represented on the page. And that's where the renderer comes in. As we looked at earlier, the base widget class defines this renderer method. So for most common applications, each custom widget doesn't need to redefine renderer as long as this pattern works for it, which we believe it should for most widgets. All the spinner needs to do is implement the render UI, which is an abstract method on the base widget class, implement the bind UI, and implement the sync UI to do the tasks we've mentioned there. So the spinner's render UI implementation, the only responsibility it has is to lay down the DOM for the spinner. And this is where we first start touching the DOM. So through the, throughout the initialization phase, there's nothing which is actively changing the DOM in any way. 
the render UI is the first place where we start laying down new DOM elements as part of this win widget rendering. Um, a little later on, we'll look into one of these methods. There's nothing really uniquely widget about them. All they do is create elements and append them to other elements in the DOM. But there are a couple of widget helper methods which help in that process, uh, which we'll look at in a little bit of detail. But anyway, render UI, pretty straightforward. Renders the input box for the spinner and renders the buttons. The sync UI step, again, for spinner is fairly straightforward. The idea of this, this phase or this step is to take the existing state of the spinner, which in this case the only important part of the state which we're looking to reflect in the DOM is the actual value. So what, what value is stored for the spinner state. And the only thing this method then needs to do is obtain that value from the model using the attribute get method and set it on the UI. Um, so it's syncing up the UI state with whatever it's got stored in its attribute model. And we'll dig into that function too a little later. And finally, the glue which holds both pieces together, the bind UI implementation. So this is where the spinner defines what needs to happen when anything in the state changes, what, what actions I need to perform. So in this case, spinner is saying whenever the value, whenever my value which I'm storing in my attribute model changes, this is the method I want to invoke. And again, following the attribute pattern, all these methods sit on the prototype. So that logic um, can easily be extended and reused if required. So that part of bind UI is handling the state to view synchronization, or the left side to right side from that diagram, if you remember it. Bind UI also sets up the opposite bridge. So it sets up DOM listeners which say, if someone interacts with the input field um, in my DOM, this is the method I should invoke which will, res will be responsible for updating my model or my state. So it'll update the value attribute which I'm storing. Right? Similarly, it sets up a key press listener on the bounding box to say, if anyone presses the page up, page down, or arrow keys within my bounding box, this is the method I want to call. And finally, as a result of this, we'll end up updating the attribute value. Um, just to touch on bind real quickly, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but in the YUI3 world, um, we're trying to uh, move to a pattern where we use bind for binding an event listener type application to a specific context um, instead of using the older bind, uh, met, uh, event subscription signature, sorry, which took the method plus the context which it needed to be bound to. It's just something to keep in mind. So before we jump into those attribute support methods which we touched on, the UI set um, value, uh, the after value change listener, I think it's worth spending a little time on um, why we chose attributes to drive the models for our components as opposed to say regular JavaScript properties. Okay. And I think the value they provide is in two key areas. The first is the, the, the fact that they just centralize management for that particular attribute. So no matter where in your widget or application for that matter, someone sets the value for the spinner, it always goes through the same validation routine. It always goes through the same setter routine, which is responsible for normalizing values. So it could take string input, for example, and convert it into an integer. And only if that's all valid does the state actually get updated. Right? If you had that implementation with regular JS properties, you need to make sure that everywhere anyone is touching that JS property, they're performing the required validation, they're performing the required setter cleanup, um, uh, which quickly leads to a fragile system, especially over the course of years and multiple developers. Right? You can see bugs creeping in there. Um, sorry, same on the getter side of things. So when anyone retrieves this value, if there's normalization to be done on the outbound side, it's localized to this getter implementation and uh, people who request the value don't need to worry about normalizing it or calling other methods to normalize it. So that's one advantage of the value, just the centralized support around the particular attribute value. The other part of it and the, the, the more powerful part is the event uh, firing. So anytime an attribute value changes and it's a valid value and it's passed through the setter correctly, the attribute system fires an attribute change. And what that does 
is allow you to reflect dependencies in your code accurately, right? So it, oh, the only thing the attribute needs to be concerned about is setting its value. If there are 10 other pieces of code in your application which you're interested in responding to that change, to so say there's a method which updates a certain piece of UI, another method which updates a string somewhere to use that new value, the attribute subsystem doesn't need to worry about that. All it does is fire off the attribute change event, which in this case, for example, we listen to to update the UI. In the classical JS property scenario, uh, what you'd need to do again is to make sure that anyone setting that JS property then knows which set of 10 methods to call to reflect that updated value in a variety of places. Right? And that, that, that set of methods won't be constant. It could be external application methods too. So the event system allows us to decouple those two things, listen both internally in terms of your widget code, plus also allow application developers to listen externally to the lowest level of state change, um, which we think is a very powerful feature. The last thing I wanted to mention um, in terms of having attributes and drive this state view uh, separation is the potential for loopback scenarios to occur. So for example, for Spinner, we have an attribute change event listener, which is saying anytime the value changes, I want to go and update the value stored in my view, which in this case is an input field value. And on the view side of things, we've got a change listener we set up to say anytime anyone types into this box and blurs, um, to be specific about it, we want to fire an event which will go and update the value we've stored in our attribute so that both, both of them are in sync. Right. And although this doesn't occur in the real spinner implementation, you could see where there's potential for loopback. So for example, if I have a change listener on my input field, it picks up a change to the value which sets an attribute which fires an event which tries to update the input field again. And if that particular interaction for Spinner, for example, if it set the value and then blurred at the same time, that would kick back this loop and it would be going around in circles. So we'll look at a way where we avoid that loopback condition, again, by using the power of the event subsystem in YUI3 to add additional data about the event based on the source which is making the value change. So let's dig into each of those attribute methods. Right? The validate value method, um, as we saw earlier, on the prototype acts as the validator for the value attribute. Nothing really complex going on here, I, but I think the key thing to note is that, again, any time this value is set, it's always going to go through this validation code, and state will not be changed if this test doesn't pass. Also, this set of logic is what I was referring to as app logic for the widget. So it has no references to DOM elements. It doesn't try to look up the value from an input field anywhere and pull it out and validate against it. It's purely contained in the model. It can be validated against the model. You can actually write tests with just test the model without the DOM or event implications. So you have a layer of tests which test your widget's app logic separately from a set of tests which test the UI interaction for it. So that's validator. The other method we came across when we were looking at the earlier slides was the UI set value method. By convention, um, again, as I mentioned, we decided not to split out the model and the render into separate classes. So to identify methods which do something with the UI, we're trying to stick with a render or underscore UI prefix. And in this case, this method is invoked as part of the attribute change event for the value attribute. And it, its only responsibility is interacting with the DOM. So this is where we actually take the value and start manipulating the DOM. In this case, it's setting the value attribute of the text field node. Yeah. So the validator code is only on the model side. You cannot do the same thing with the DOM. Right, right. you cannot. You, ca you cannot, but the idea of encapsulating that logic in a prototype method means that you can invoke it from somewhere else, right? So you could have a DOM listener, your change listener, for example, could invoke the same validator to make sure you have a valid value before passing it or using it somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. So if the DOM is out of sync, but you could validate that fact, the fact that the state hasn't updated and revert to the currently stored value, for example, if you wanted to. And if you look at the example on the site, it, it's actually doing that. I, I left it out of this for simplicity. 
but that, that's what it ends up doing. Um, so we looked at, uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, yeah, we looked at the, the set UI method. Uh, we looked at the validator. This is where that loopback control I was referring to kicks in. Um, it's going back a couple of slides. The after value change method was the listener we set up to be fired whenever the attribute state changes, the, attribute, uh, the value attribute state changes. So when that happens, this method will get invoked. And we use a source attribute we set up on the event facade, which is provided by the YUI3 event infrastructure, to determine what the source of that change was. So in this case, if, that source, if the source of that change came from the UI, we know the UI is already reflecting a 20 or a 21 or whatever that value was. We don't want to set, send the change back to the UI in that case. But in all other cases, we want to update our model, or update the UI, sorry, which is what that method call ends up doing. And on the flip side of that equation, on our DOM listener for the input change, we make sure that when the value is set with the new value, it's identifying the source it came from so that the after logic has the ability to filter out programmatically set values versus from values set from the UI. So walk through a couple more of the DOM event listener side of the equation. Again, nothing um, specifically widget related here, apart from, again, stressing the fact that this particular method doesn't have to worry about validating the value it's got. It doesn't have to worry about normalizing it. It doesn't have to worry about invoking other methods which might be waiting for that change. All it does is set the value in the attribute, and the system takes care of the rest. And so all that code is cleanly decoupled. The thing you can concentrate on here in this particular method <coughs> is translating the, the DOM event to the value which needs to be set in the model. And that's all it does. So in the long run, um, it leads to more maintainable code. You tend to have less monolithic methods which are doing state-related stuff plus UI-related stuff plus kicking off a bunch of other stuff. Everything, every method is a smaller method which does specifically what it's supposed to. Another example of that, I think, is this next slide. Again, same thing. Nothing um, really widget related here, apart from, again, stressing the fact that we have another method which is setting the value. Again, that doesn't need to replicate validation code, setter code, whatever else. So I promised earlier we'll look at one of the rendering methods, which the render UI method ends up invoking. Again, um, here, nothing clearly widget specific in terms of the implementation, pretty straightforward. The job of this method is to create the elements which represent the spinner's buttons and add them to the DOM. So in this case, it's getting a reference to the widget's content box and appending a button element which it creates. The two methods we're pointing out, though, are widgets get string implementation, which gets you the localized version of the increment string, which is used in this case for the um, title or the tooltip for the button, and also the standardized or normalized class name. So the result of this call will be the prefixed version of the increment class, which it can use to mark the button element with. Sorry, last couple of implementation slides. I think we're done. This one, again, touching on the standardized class name generation support. Sorry. Um, so you can call widgets get class name method with um, suffix part of your class name, if you will, and it'll introduce the standardized prefix for that particular widget. Same for the value example. And if you want purely the prefix version, you can call get class name without any arguments, and it'll return the non-suffix version of it. And finally, what this all means in terms of a CSS implementation. Right, so for the spinner, we use the marker class, which is used to define visibility in this case, hiddenness, I guess. Um, but so we're, we're in, in terms of widget implementations, we're moving away from setting styles directly on elements and using marker classes instead to define state. In this case, the spinner is saying, because it's an inline or an inline block element, uh, when I'm hidden, I want to use display none as opposed to, for example, moving off screen somewhere or using visibility hidden to control my visibility. So you have the ability to customize what the widget is doing 
purely through CSS without changing any code. In the same way, the bounding box marker, which is this one, is used to define the functional layout aspects of the widget. So in this case, it's saying that my spinner widget is an inline block type of widget and uh, doing a bunch of stuff for cross-browsing normalization. But the message there is that it's an inline block widget. It's not a block widget or any other type of widget. And finally, the visual handling, which I mentioned, is applied to the content box. So this is where we start applying things like a border and padding and a background color example. And the rest of these standardized class name markers. <coughs> so I think that's about it in terms of implementation. To the end user, what that looks like is this. So they can have, for example, a progressively uh, enhanced solution where they have markup already on the page, which we want to use to drive the initial value of the spinner. Call the constructor pointing to that markup and render it to get a spinner with that initial value, right? Alternatively, if they didn't have markup on the page, they could provide an initial value here if they wanted to and specify where in the DOM they wanted the widget rendered to. So that's the final result. Um, let me see if I'm live here. I can show you what that looks like. If I have it up and running. It's not good. get that over there for you. So that's the functional example we're looking at. You can see it has keyboard support. So we have DOM event listeners firing here, which are updating the value stored for the spinner. It has basic button support. And it has that min-max validation we were talking about. So you can't see it, but even though I'm hitting the down key, the model integrity is maintained, right? And that should be live, so if that's something you want to play around with. So this particular implementation probably doesn't behave well, but the idea here is that if I typed it in, my input change listener would pass through the validator implementation we were talking about. If it's invalid, it could call sync UI, for example, to say use the currently stored state as opposed to updating it. And if it's valid, it could pass it through. And I think the key idea there is just the fact that we're not replicating all this logic in multiple places. So I wanted to end up um, with just the plans for widget um, moving into free one, which as Eric mentioned this morning, um, we're aiming to nail down GA quality for the widget in that time frame. What we've got on the roadmap between now and then um, is more thorough IATN support. So right now we looked at the get strings method, for example. The widget has the ability to programmatically set um, string name value pairs, for example, uh, for specific locales. It'll maintain them, do the lookup chaining, for example, from EN US to EN on the client side if it needs to. But that's a programmatic interface. Um, what we want to do is provide declarative support for it so you can dump a JSON blob down on the page, have it register as the set of strings for a calendar or for a spinner or anything else, for ex example. Have that JSON be a combined JSON output so you could combine localized strings for multiple widgets across multiple locales, dump them as one blob, have them register with some kind of IATN manager, which then the widget could look up for string input as opposed to programmatically having to set them. Um, I'm, I, I implied it there, but the second part of that equation was support for um, web service interaction. So you could hit a web service with the locale you're looking for, get this standardized blob back down on your page and have it um, update your localized strings for the widget. And then uh, formatting support. So support for things like tokens, for example, in localized strings. Plus, um, we already have infrastructure for date, currency, uh, localization, that type of thing. Um, we're looking at simplifying the HTML parser implementation. So currently, right now, it keys off of the, count, uh, the content box to look for existing markup on the page, which might drive widget configuration. And we want to open that up so you could point to anywhere on the page. It might not, not necessarily be somewhere on the page which ends up being part of the final widget but it's just a pointer which the user can say, this is where my markup 
is coming from, which defines the initial configuration for my widget. And um, that should simplify the need for the user to know what the content box is and what the bounding box is, for example. We want to finalize the bounding box and content box structure. Uh, and the main thing I'm thinking about there is whether the two box structure is overkill for any widgets or not. We found that it's useful in a large majority of widgets, but I can see certain use cases where you just want the bounding box. There is no need for that dual box structure. So that's something we're trying to evaluate. Um, and also, as part of the 3-1 effort, there's a bunch of people, a lot of them in this room, who've started developing production quality widgets on top of the current widget infrastructure. We want to make sure we get their feedback, incorporate fixes for any pain points they've hit, and make sure we maintain anything which they deemed as a value add. So, so that's the roadmap for widget from here to Q1 of 010. I think that's about it. Um, ran a little long, but we have some time for questions, if anyone has any. Go ahead. Uh, yes, we are. So um, I'm not sure if Todd covered any of that in his um, accessibility talk, but there, we definitely have the concept of a focus manager, which will handle keyboard interaction, for example, for widgets. Um, anything else we need accessibility related, just by having a generic widget class in place, and the generic content structure and uh, class name structure, we can help drive all of that through that common interface. But yes, there are plans for generic accessibility support. Yep. Uh, using the, the using the the right. The um, actually, so, so the programmatic way overrides the markup. So if they're also specifying that value in their constructor, that's going to win. There is, I mean, um, if you really did, uh, it's a good point actually. So as part of the HTML parser cleanup, we're also looking at providing pre and post HTML parser hooks. And that could potentially be a way where you could make that decision if you wanted to. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. So. Right, the user doesn't have to specify a separate package. So when you say um, use calendar, it'll pull down the JS plus the CSS for the calendar. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the example of the content box, yeah. Right. It, it's derived from that. So it, that structure, um, if you look at the YUI2 container implementations, or at least the ones which have more visualization handling, like Panel, for example, that introduces this double box concept. The idea of a header, bot, or footer is, footer is not something we're enforcing for all widgets uh, for obvious reasons. But um, going back to the extension slide, the way overlay is built is combining the base widget class with this extension, which adds header, body, footer support. So you could optionally choose to include it in whichever widget class you're packaging. Any other questions? Yep. I believe so. I have to admit I'm not too up to date on the HTML5 specs. I'm not uh, sure which areas you're talking about. Um, right, so all that, um, in, as far as it relates to the base widget class, um, the, the set of markup it uses for the content box, the bounding box, is all configurable. So when you create a custom widget, if you want to use parts of it which rely on the HTML5 spec, you're free to. Right, so um, it, I think, uh, try not to put my foot in my mouth in terms of events, but in, in terms of generic custom event infrastructure, all events, all custom events essentially have prefix related support in them. Yeah, so the way that event is defined in the event subsystem is with the prefix. Now when you're listening for it on the widget instance, so when you use the widget.on or .after methods, 
you don't need the prefix. That's automatically filled in for you. So you can just say spinner dot on render do this. Um, but it's only when you're bubbling to other targets where you could have a mix of um, event sources, if you will, that prefix comes into play. Yeah. 